Welcome once more to the Magician's Manse. Today, I regale you with the story of our group's first dying earth adventure. Pilgrims of the Black Obelisk was written by Julian Burnick and Mark Bruner for use with Dungeon Crawl Classics RPG. The table was four players and me as the Game Master. First things first, we rolled up 12 zero-level PCs, three for each player. Quillian the Pilgrim, Vildebeck the Major Domo, Halor the Shopkeeper, Scarabus the Gardener, Mu the Apprentice Butcher, Publio the Clerk, Aluthi the Savant, Munoth the Ascetic, Daguzai the Seer, Maruz the Carpenter, Atiol the Cloud Rider, and Polarion the Vat Thing. The PCs met at the Inn of the Violet Imp, a group of Ammonite pilgrims who were assembling on a ritual quest to the holy city of Urzi Damath. There they would perform the oblatory rituals, in hopes that their exaltations would summon forth their serpentine god, Omeyat Ko. For at Urzi Damath rose the Black Obelisk, at whose base were five godhead shrines, each venerating a different deity. And so it was that many such pilgrims took the path from the Inn of the Violet Imp southwards toward the holy city beyond the river Scamander. When the stars were right, the pilgrims tethered up a pair of one-horned Wariot wagons. Consulting a crude map, they decided to traverse the road leading through Blanwalt Forest which was said to be haunted by leucomorphs and witches. So that night, the red sun sunk in accordance with the old ritual. The next morning, the pilgrims set out by caravan. The first two days were without incident, beyond the distant howling of unknown beasts in the night. Blanwald Forest was an archaic wood, thick with trees and grasping brambles. The dirt road was scantily traveled. On the third day, the pilgrims rounded a bend in the path and came upon a hut with a smoking chimney. It sat in a meadow with a muddy sty built off to the side. The creatures contained looked like pigs with the faces of men. The smell of sweetmeats and molded cheese drifted from the stout little cabin. They go in. They're hungry. After all, they've been eating nothing but trail tack and lentils for days. When they have their backs turned munching down on sausage pies, a dark shape unfolds from the shadows of the chimney mantle. A wicked callow hag. She points her wand of twisted branch into the back of the oaf Moonoth, but he makes his save and the magic has no effect. A melee breaks out, and they're bumping into tables, swinging their weapons about, pottery is smashing. They actually manage to damage the elusive callow hag. With a shriek, she shoots back through the chimney and retreat, and they see her no more. They looted the place and got some of her bone jars from the shelf. Someone looted her folio of curses. After dealing with the callow hag, the pilgrims forged on. A day was lost as one of the carts got stuck in a deep rut that fractured a wheel, warranting repair. Otherwise, they went unmolested. On the fifth day, they came upon a huge tree that had grown over the road its roots forming a tunnel where the wagons would have to pass through. Large fruits in various animal shapes hung from the branches. There was a little hut built into the top of the tree, and as the caravan got closer, a window on the hut swung open, and this crazy, loony, old man wizard in dirty brown robes screeches, You down there! Offer up one of your pack beasts to my tree! Or instead, some of yourselves. Two or three of the healthier ones would do. They discuss for a moment, and a few step forward as if they're going to sacrifice themselves. At the last minute, they strike forward as the mad hermit pours blood on the tree, animating its limbs. Giant branches are whipping around, attacking the pilgrims with wide sweeps. Mu and Moonoth clamber up the tree trunk to kill him in melee. One of the characters, Thalor, throws thyle dust at the tree. Pause. At the time, I had no idea what Thyldes did. 
I have a hazy recollection of its use in Missouri and the Magician, but I can't know for sure. I asked Devon what she was hoping it would do against the tree. She wanted to stun it, so we put it to the test on a binary D6. One, two, or three is a no. Four, five, or six is yes. She rolled? Yes. I told her to roll a D6 to see how many rounds it will last. Only one round till the killer branches reanimate. This is what being a game master is all about, and really is the core essence of vintage play. My player wanted to do something that had no written rule, so instead of looking something up, we negotiated the terms together, always using the d6 as an anchor. Miraculously, they killed the hermit with no pilgrim deaths. After he perished, the tree thundered off into the forest, stomping around like a maddened ghoul bear. Shaken but unharmed, the pilgrims continued on the path. That was session one. We broke. Two weeks later, we meet up again. They came upon the River Weir, which wasn't labeled on their map. It ran straight through the forest. A big stone bridge was built over the river. On the far side, two Barbican towers flanked a tall wooden gate. The pilgrim caravan approached, and a little window slid open near the top of the gate. A squirrely man shouts out, all pilgrims must pay the god tithe. Ten terses per head, five per pack beast. We are the tithe priests, and you must pay the tithe. There was some negotiating back and forth. I believe a bottle of vintage wine was traded. Somebody traded their fine hat. I think they paid ten terses, and three pilgrims dug in the mud for the priest's favorite delicacy, clams and cockles. Those that did had their tax waived, but their garments were soiled by acrid filth. Our Vatfing Polarion had a weft in his mind that caused him to seek love eternal, and he asked if there were any among the priests that could give him love this night. We rolled it on a d6, and of course he got the six. The tithe priests had a Vatfing serving as an accountant of their terses. She was a beautiful creature, but not for the intestines which spilled freely from her gaping belly. Nonetheless, he bedded her for the night. The rest of the pilgrims, too, slept in the safety of the tithe towers. The next day, the pilgrims made their way out of the forest and into the plains. Barren, windswept wastes stretched as far as the eye could see, here and there stippled with crumbling stone ruins. At midday, they came across other Ammonite pilgrims on the road ahead, meandering about. Some lay in the dust, curled. Others stumbled about as if in a daze. Quillian, a devout pilgrim himself, approached to see what ailed them. He put a hand on the shoulder of one young pilgrim and turned her to face him, only to find infectious black crystal overgrown where her eyes should be. Quillian's player rolled a natural 20 on initiative, but we used clockwise board game initiative, and she was sitting directly to my right. The Ammonite girl lunged at Quillian, who struck her down, but the remaining five attacked him before the rest of the party got to go. Quillian was brutally killed before the party slayed all the infected. In turn, they suffered no casualty. Unfortunately, their fallen friend failed the save to resist the black crystal infection, which rapidly began spreading over his reanimating corpse. As soon as Quillian died, I said he would return in 1d4 rounds with the Black Crystal Infection. Of course you rolled one round. Moonoth and Polarion tried subduing their undying friend, but the attempt failed. The thing that was once Quillian broke free and bounded off into the barren plains, vanishing on the horizon. He will for sure have to come back. That's just a crazy character who lives out in our version of the dying earth now. That was our first PC death. They're close now, only a day away from Ertzi Damoth. They can see the tip of the black obelisk rising up to the horizon across the plains. The next day, while they're traveling along the dusty road, red sun blazing overhead, an unnatural storm brews on the horizon and very quickly overtakes the pilgrims. I tell them to make their saves, and everyone who fails falls asleep. Everybody but two player characters.
the sleeping pilgrims wake up in another dimension. It's a black plane that runs in every direction. On a preposterous throne sits a nine-foot-tall abominable man with curved bull horns. Hairy faces protrude from his knees and crotch, and he clutches a crackling spear in his rubbery right claw. It's a demon. Next to him hovers a rippling portal that leads back to Earth, dripping with fire. And he's like, Greetings, pilgrims of Omeyatko, my ancient rival. Omeyatko is not as powerful as I. Which among you will pledge yourself to me? Kneel down and bind myselves. I wish to find footing in your plane. You shall perform the obligatory rituals in my name instead. My players look at their characters' alignments and decide who would pledge and who would stay loyal to Ome at Ko. Five of the nine pilgrims immediately bowed to Amvos, some of them burning lots of luck to succeed. Those that pledged were spirited out of the dream, while Amvos charged his lightning spear, screaming, Die, insolent creatures! Luckily, the guy to my left won the initiative, so the whole party used their turns sprinting for the portal of fire and made it to safety. Now, the party was mixed with both faithful and heretics, causing a great divide. Still, their destination was close at hand, so they continued onward to the holy city. The pilgrims arrived, battered and worn, to Ertzi Damath. It was a large city, more vast than any they had seen before, though the greater part lay tumbled in ruin. Here and there, magnificent jewel-encrusted manses rose between shabby structures of mud and rotted wood. Above, the gigantic black obelisk rose like a pointing finger, high into the sanguine sky. They stabled the wariots and stored the carts. With what little terses they had left, they fetched baths and warm meals at any inns with vacancy. The city was packed with the folk of many lands and beliefs, so that it was no small task to find lodging. Lentils and mushroom wine were supped upon, and all rested well. Now, early the next morning they prepared for the obligatory rituals, studying their holy texts. The precepts of Omate Ko state that in order to summon his avatar back to this world, you have to go through three ritualistic triumvates. Unfortunately, the exactitudes of the ritual had been lost with the prophet Amon's death. It is said that Amon saw Omeyat Ko ascend to the heavens, departing from the Black Obelisk. The great god bestowed the three triumvates upon Amon, that he might summon him back to this plane at a later time. Shortly after Omeyat Ko's departure, Amon and the other prophets were run out of Urzi Damath and slain. Thus the Codex was lost. Let's stop there for a second rewind. When the infected crystal-eyed pilgrims were searched, our party of pilgrims found Amon's ancient text upon one of their bodies. The language was ancient, but the sick pilgrims seemed to have translated bits of it and cracked a sort of code. But even with the translation, they couldn't make heads or tails of that puzzle, which was hilarious, but also awesome because it shifted our storyline a bit. So they didn't really know what the proper ritual to summon Omeyat Ko was. With this knowledge, let the obligatory rituals proceed. There was the serpentine god's statue, carved of stone and draped with the skins of his devout followers. A bunch of Ammonite pilgrims are out there trying all these crazy rituals, and nothing is working. It's then that Ambo strikes. His little demonlings materialize amongst the crowd. People start screaming as these impish creatures rampantly attack with curved obsidian daggers. They're stabbing away, and we roll to see how many there are. 3d4. We got eight of them. The party hears Amvos's booming voice. Rise up, my faithful. Rise up those who are loyal to me. Kill anyone loyal to Omid Ko, my true rival. Do this! This crazy PvP battle breaks out, where all the opposed characters start killing each other. 
PCs are dying left, right, and center. Polarion the Vat Thing started with a black horse and a short sword. He's just riding around taking off heads and slaying his own PCs who serve Omvos. Publio is killing demonlings wildly. Someone is killed by a trowel through the heart. Needless to say, it was a bloodbath. By hook and by crook, they were able to slay all eight of the demonlings that were trying to complete the ritual to summon Omvos into this world. He almost got here, his silhouette shimmering as it took physical form, but the pilgrims ultimately stopped his arrival. In doing so, the statue of Omate Ko was destroyed, and no god made a full appearance that day. With the demonlings dead, the remaining Omvosi cultists threw down their weapons. So what we did was separate the survivors into two parties. I took Omvosi cultists as NPCs, and the loyalist pilgrims took a class into first level. In hindsight, I think I'll just keep them in the back burner as a player party too. It could be really cool to zoom over to see what Omvos wants his new cultists to do after the failed summoning ritual. Of the pilgrims that survived, we have Vildebeck, major domo of a noble house and the seventh son. Publio, an intelligent clerk who was raised by wolves. Moonoff, a lucky but dumb ascetic who follows the path of the bear and Polarion, a well-rounded vat thing cast off, born under the loom with a void yearning for love. These characters will advance to first level and continue their adventures into the dying earth. Thus ends the story of the Pilgrims of the Black Obelisk. I had a ton of fun running the adventure. If you thought of something cool while listening, drop a comment down below. I'd love to talk to you about my experiences running DCC Dying Earth as well as other role-playing games. If you enjoyed the video, consider leaving a like. It helps the machine gods of the illimitable algorithm boost the signal of this channel that we might bring the beauty and wonder of the dying earth to wayfarers new and old. Thank you for listening to our tale.